for their family reunion instead of turkey and dressing, one man brought the message that we're all dumb as shit and going to die. Yet some of them still ask if he was sure he didn't have some giblets in his pocket. <laughs> Genetics may run, but they can't hide due to the fact that they can't run. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sneered a cousin. Then how come you got that gravy dripping down your vest? Life being nonlinear, man invented reality and imposed it their own to make it seem so. And damn if it didn't work. <laughs> Were it not for basic 87 octane, no one's car would run. And could not higher combustible levels be produced, there could be no racing machines. All grades of gasoline come from the same source, same as all human thought arises from a common well. The matter then becomes, to what degree will you refine yours? Further note to those wishing to blueprint their engine. For optimum efficiency, your fuel should be non-sticky. Today's useful myth and attendant quiz. In return for him having once pulled some unsavory local conditions from its paw, life offered a certain man a certain choice. He could either never even have the itch to know, and thus be spared any possible disappointment or aggravation, or he could go ahead and have that extraordinary urge and take his chances. Now, if you were the man in the story, what would you have done? <clears throat> in some lands, when children don't like the bedtime tales they're told, they're shoved up on the mattress to spend the night, or until they come to their little senses. <laughs> So you better be careful how you answer. <laughs> News from the neural court. After the king heard the proposition that attacking the cripple simply keeps them upright, he stopped censuring his thoughts. <laughs> now news from just around the block. One man would keep track of his great thoughts only until the drugs ran out. The totality of ever active, omnipresent, omnidirectional life being too expansive for ordinary awareness to comprehend, it cuts the form into discrete sequential segments that it then functionally perceives to be reality. Understanding of this also reveals why the notion of time is such an inseparable ingredient in man's routine mental operations. For every mystical approach, there is an anti-approach, and for every approach, an anti, and for every approach, an anti-approach, there is a hard-to-see one that runs in direction different from both. That's right. Go ahead. Ask me where. Ask me where. That's right. Better yet, ask you where. Where? Only those Columbuses who return ever described the new world. According to legend, there was once a man in a mystical school who said, you know you've been here too long when what they're talking about begins to make sense. <laughs> Did it really sell in the box? Kills pain on contact? <laughs> the problem with the ordinary mind is that it attempts to Answer irrelevant questions, solve non-existent problems, fix things not broken, and untangle things not improperly tangled. And now a feature we call psychology today. I'm sorry, sir, but that's already been taken. Okay, uh, psychology sometime later. From the city approach, the origin of all thought is the thinking about thought. While well, a few outside the limits look more to a genesis of anchovies and cabbage. How many times, you reckon, will the cooks in the basement have to burn dinner before those upstairs get suspicious? <laughs> uh, on that special day of the week, as a gift to himself, one man would ask himself, these questions. 
Why live in the dark when you can see? Why remain in the days when things can be made clear? Why be local when you can be universal? And why be dumb when you can be smart? And on that very special once a year day, he'd wrap it all up into the single question, why just think when you could actually be more conscious? Now a follow-up to that diagnosis the doctor earlier believed you missed regarding the brain coom mind that said, livers are livers and spleens are spleens, and this is the strangest case ever seen. To wit, the brain is the only organ that denies that it does what it does. <laughs> the inner mental battle. Literal thinking wants to overdo the assault due to its uncertainty as to the enemy. If all days were so, as similar as common minds believe, there would be no open skies for future birds to fly. If all thoughts were as similar as collective minds believe, there could be no neural juice to light a Christmas tree. If all your possibilities are no more than you have thought, then all of your potential has been murdered by your mind. If allegiance to glue is all that keeps one safe and sane, the more alert will struggle to strip themselves free from themselves. Regarding the matter of hyperactivity, once man had been created and had developed an intellect to go along with his physical presence, life gave each person a choice of either being primarily hyper or mostly active. <laughs> or, or the misplacement of his sword tied Alexander up in knots. <laughs> what is history and memory other than the nonlinear being made straight? And what is a man when this has been done to his neural system other than common, normal, mundane, ordinary, and common? It's easy for the simple to appear sincere. They have nothing to be sincere about. Uh, as the old blues singer on the corner did again his rendition of, Stick out your can, here comes the garbage man. A chap passing by being stuck in some uncertain place between a hormonal interpretation thereof and a neural one didn't know whether to toss him a tip or shoot him. Then, of course, there was a man who would tolerate allegories only as long as the drugs held out. The cut on his finger served him so well that one man put one on his tongue. And being so impressed with that move, then managed one to his brain. The moral probably being that, men who live in hair shirts should never throw out any drugs. Hey, you never know what tomorrow may bring. <laughs> and now, tonight's news fable as read by me, playing the part of one presenting it. In his later days, did the great ruler, Ming Kaitis, reflect. Ah, but had the itch of my youth survived with me into my aging, my mystical dreams might by now have been realized. I'm going to have to break in right here and say personally that I really do not favor having to read stories like this one that seem to present that extraordinary human possibility in such a negative context. Yeah, I know that viewers themselves never object, but that's not the point. <laughs> Privately revised version of the above tale. A man bitten on the leg by a dog can benefit if fresh teeth marks he can become. Let's be clear. In the area of originality of thought, there is no such thing as partial originality. A man wrote the comprehensive doctor, Dear Doctor, I am unclear and confused in this matter and need a comprehensive explanation. How can anything be truly original within a closed system? Signed, puzzled. They're puzzled. They can't. 
But you can't let that stop you. Because your initial natural conception of what constitutes anything original is constricted to a degree never suspected by those mentally living in a closed system unawares. As always, my dear puzzled, as regards the matter of the apparently impossible, it may at first seem spuriously simple for a bird to urge one with no wings to fly. But it's different if the latter turns out to be a caterpillar not yet realized into its ultimate butterfly nature. There was once a man who began to privately realize that at the very least, there is a special danger in speech for the more perceptive, particularly in, the, in them listening to their own literal thinking. In that, by its very nature, words inescapably establish limits and boundaries to those things about which they speak. And to the degree to which you realize this, you likewise understand the basic lack of useful seriousness inherent in what men normally have to say. Thus do the more conscious, right out in public, in plain view, become secretive verbal recluses. And the man responded, am I my brother's keeper? And the magistrate said, no, but you're acting as bailey for his cliches. <laughs> Not so, countered the man. That was the collectively controlled part of his own mind doing that. And in a better courtroom somewhere, such a witness would then have been shot. <laughs> you have to be dumber than other people to enjoy hearing them talk. <laughs> Trying to save you the personal discomfort of thinking about that one. Okay, fairness and equal time regarding an earlier item. Man is the only creature who denies that he is what he is. How about the possibility that the enlightenment is no more than a freedom from this? The code master's dictum. Think in code, speak in code, but don't let anyone know. It. <laughs> and now, dearly beloved, as we slowly raise the coffin into the ground, a final word regarding the awakening. It is, perhaps, the one punchline no one awaits. Mm -hmm. Dig it. According to some people's recollection, we were still talking about the non-lineal progression of thinking that I conjured up of literal into the combined allegorical and then into the original. A side approach, believe it or not, into the idea of original thought as a transforming method as a kind of personal effort leading toward a rebirth. In that sense, a man's ordinary mind, and we're talking now back at the floor level of the theater of life, the level at which everyone is born, in which the mind operates at a literal level thinks at a literal level, speaks at a literal level, and that is proper. This mind also operates as the critical function. And it could even be called a critical mind. Or literal thinking can be called, in part, very often, critical thinking. It's not theory. It's nothing metaphysical. It's just by the ordinary, it's not only overlooked, but if it was pointed out, they would see no particular pertinence in it. Contraire, contraire. But critical thinking, and also remember we're talking about the secondary mental civilized level of man. We're not talking about the level at which we're dealing with matters 
inherently pertinent to one's physical survival. We're talking about all things singularly human, which translate into all things singularly mentally based. The literal mind from which all of civilization, all of man's progress, all of man's post-Eden activities are based, in large part is a critical operation. And we have been through many times from different directions, but I'll point out to you, at the ordinary level, there is certainly nothing improper about this. That the critical function of the mind is in part the uh, motivation behind technology. As I said, it is the basis of all civilization, but consider the critical aspect. Men can, we'll assume from the cave paintings and the diaries of, we'll assume after all these years, men survived without indoor plumbing, without air conditioning, central heat. Then he began to think, to take the kind of cartoon evolutionary approach of caveman up to most of you. <laughs> you could look at, at that level, the, what I'm saying, the critical aspect of literal thinking. See, it's the critical mind of man. You could look at the caveman sitting around after hundreds, thousands of years, and they begin to talk to one another, and somebody criticizes the fact of, boy, isn't it a pain in the old wazoo that every time it gets cold around here, we have to go in there and huddle up in the cave, try to wrap ourselves up around our relatives, some of whom do not bathe often enough, just to stay warm for six months. It's a criticism. Whereas, back, remember, this is, there's nothing improper, nothing untoward about this, but if we look at our survival, our physical level, as being on a par with the rest of the creatures on this planet, no other creature, obviously, can criticize the weather. If they don't like it, they either lump it and die, if it's bad enough, if it's inclement enough for their physical survival, or else they will move on. But they certainly do not criticize it. It's obvious, or should be, but now the way in which I describe man, that no creature without an intellect and a tongue to match, to work with it, can engage in criticism anyway, but you understand, even if they were mute in some way, you can all fathom the reality of that, that dogs get cold and they shiver. They get too cold and you know, it can be serious physical trauma to them. But there is no sign that they do not criticize even aspects of existence that can be critical to their continued survival. Only man has a critical mind. Only man can complain and whine. But you can also see at a very basic level, you could see that very kind of criticism and whining as leading to, after months, years, decades of bitching about having to go inside, stay inside for six months out of the year, and it's stuffy in there, and you've got all the relatives that eat garlic and won't bathe and all that stuff. Somebody comes up with the idea of some kind of air conditioning for the caves or some kind of internal heat. You understand that their criticism of life led to other things. All right, just want to cover that. That is still very close to the primary level of existence, to the bio-survival level. But then when you get into the critical level that is, by any reasonable standard, a bit out of grasp, a bit beyond any bio-survival needs. That is, you're complaining, you find out Let's push the caveman cartoon scenario up a bit. And you find out people starting now but to worship gods in some way. And you find out the people in the cave in the next mountain down to the left of you, that they're worshiping a god, uh, a boulder god. <laughs> That's B-O-U-L-D-E-R, not a pushy one. <laughs> a boulder god. Whereas you and your people, for some enlightened reason or for some reason you don't know, you grew up in a family that worships tree gods. And you find this to be, whenever you have some spare time now from trying to stay alive, you sing around, hobby, no monopoly, no TV. And what's, what was the first hobby man ever have? I didn't mean to give this kind of really inside anthropological <laughs> revelations, but all of you have already figured out man's first hobby and still one of his primary ones is bitching, complaining, whining, criticizing. So, you've got the fact, and I am not playing...
some sort of uh, pseudo-spiritual or New Age I idea that all religions are worthy of due respect. All religions are the same. I mean, they're no different. But I'm not playing some, I'm not playing apolog apologist for religions now. All I want to do is point out that we're now into areas that could have been art. They're now starting to, how about the paint? You find your neighbors, another cave are now beginning to paint on the wall. And you go over there to visit one weekend, one Saturday, and you and your family look. And the guy's wife said, look what Cuby did. He painted this. And you look at it. And you go back home and you take up painting. And you do charcoals and stuff. And then you go back a few weeks later and they say, he's getting better. Or whatever. And you go over there. And maybe all the other people there for the Saturday night get together. They say, boy, that Huber, he is the greatest cave painter we have yet to produce. And you go back home to your wife and you, your family. And you say, well, look at my stuff. Isn't it as good? Isn't it better than his? And they all go, oh, yeah, man. You know, knowing which side they're yeah. little stone muffins are buttered on. <laughs> you become the point we're getting at without using religion. It could be art. It could be politics. You find out politics start and you find the people down the road in the next cave are conservative. Whereas you are liberal. Many of you have only been political now. You only had it for a week <laughs> on the whole planet. But suddenly you find the people down there have a different political <laughs> view from you. What do you do? You know this. You get critical. Now, it may or may not lead to fisticuffs or open warfare. That's not even the point now. You become critical. And you don't doubt it. It is not questioned. It is a natural part of literal thinking. It is a natural part of man's ordinary mind. But, as I point out from another view, a view having nothing to do with not only Bio survival, physical survival, but having nothing to do with ordinary mental survival in this life. But from another view, you may care to read that as your view, we hope. A higher, a more complex view. The ordinary mind continually deals, continually attempts to do such things as answer irrelevant questions, solve non existent problems. Fix things not broken and untangle things not improperly tangled. It is the job of the mind to take the survival needs, the primary world as I oft times call it, the primary aspect of man's existence, and to complexify it, to tangle it up, to make it more complicated than it is, to turn sex into romance, eating into dining, Sleeping into subscription or living and sleeping into lifetime subscription to architectural digest or something else that would physically have a negative impact on a sane person, whatever that meant. <laughs> by, by any, again, by any sane view, if I could have a man, a sane man's attention for a moment, I could make him see, well, they'll do it even without my attempt, man's critical mind oftentimes will selectively pick out aspects of normal civilized existence and criticize it. To wit, people far removed from any attempted form of increased consciousness, any form of metagnostic effort, continually, have always, will continually complain that those not necessarily, that those particularly not living in their cave are making life too complicated. The conservatives will say, well, the, uh, the liberals in the political body of man continually make things too complicated. They want to turn government into a new God. They want to make government get too intrusive in our lives. They should just leave us alone and let people look after themselves. They either will or they won't. Uh, Protestants could look at Catholics and say, well, listen, religion's gotten way out of hand. They had the right idea back when Jesus got it started and Peter but now they got all this thing about bailing people out of hell and you know having to confess to somebody and you gotta or if you're a Muslim you gotta play pray five times a day. You know, hey, once is a strain. God intended us to pray once. So looking at it from a critical view, ordinary people can see much. This doesn't prove anything, but I want you to understand this is not a foreign concept. Ordinary people selectively, ordinary minds will selectively look around at life and pick out aspects without any problem, without having to major in philosophy at all pick out aspects of other aspects of life of which they are not an active participant and find it to be too complicated. Mm -hmm. They may call it many other things, but I'm using that to get you to, along the lines of me talking about 
the mind trying to untangle things that are not improperly entangled to begin with. It was a mind's job. God sent Ken and Barbie out of the garden, told them to go out and work, but no way to look at was get out of here. You now know how to live. You're going to live another whatever it was back then. 35 to 60 years or 700 years, you'll make that. But now get out there and get things more complicated. Produce man's secondary world. Get civilized. Come up with those kinds of things now that are not inherently required for survival physically. So they went out and did it. Man has made life, in a sense, more and more complicated. But it's not a foreign concept to say that they... that. It is too complicated. I'm not saying that yet, you understand. But ordinary people, selectively, will say it's too complicated, which produces the idea of the dreams of uh, returning back to some more native state, running off to Tahiti, being able to finally retire and get out of the rat race. But the whole idea was quite ordinary minds will selectively turn around if they just hear the idea that, God, we've gotten things too complicated. People all across the political, religious spectrum of life will go, yeah. They mean it selectively, though, because if they're actually playing, they'll go, yeah, and they'll hope you'll shut up so they can bring up the examples they had in mind. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, and they'll we'll start saying, yeah, and they'll start pointing selectively. The selectivity of it makes no matter. That is simply the ordinary mind being in local matters when they're universal to start with. But look at these picture on a greater level. Taking my not unduly described scenario, the man's mind was in charge of taking simple physical life as it was at one time, as it was in your life at one time when you were a little nipper, a little toddler, a little coochie coo. But it has been the, man, the job of man's mind to take that beyond the required for the physical existence and produce a civilized world, as I sometimes call it, life in the city, as I sometimes call it, ordinary existence, the middle of the parade, just civilization in all of its aspects. Because by civilization, I intend to mean that beyond, above, and beyond the things minimally required for physical survival, all, everything that arises from man's mind it was his job to make the primary, the survival aspects, more complicated. Because they are certainly not complicated. It's eat or be at. It's eat or starve. It's get laid, that is procreate, or be the last of your line, be the last of breed. Get out of the rain, or freeze to death and die. Get a cold and die. All of that is simple. I mean, it's so simple that before long it was of no great consequence. And with people in this day and time that would might be hearing my words, it's of no consequence. None. You got to be you got to be far removed from even minimally middle class and sane to starve to death, to freeze to death, to go without sex in this day and time. You have got to be I don't, almost willfully stupid. I mean you've got to be on a suicidal mission. It's impossible. You can lay down in the middle of the street and look like you're starving and Nowadays, either some charitable person or some bureaucrat, somebody that wants your vote, will come along and force you to eat. They'll take you home with them. <laughs> or they'll propose some sort of new local taxation so that they can build a new homeless shelter in time to get you in it tomorrow. Surviving is not the problem. And so now you have a world that seems to become more and more complicated, as it, again, as it should. But look at it from a wide perspective Without, I'll assume you can do it. If not, I'm about to do it for you. Don't thank me. I knew you wouldn't. Without any judicial selectivity, just look at the overall picture now and don't let your mind think of any example. Now, you can do that, you know, because all of you prove that you can absolutely not think of flying pigs, Refried mishmash. Don't think about it. So do not think of any specific example. Okay, you ready? Here we go now. So as soon as I, I'll count one, two, three, and after three, you will not think of any example, no matter what I talk about. Right? Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Uh, 
It is the mind's job to make life more and more complex or complicated, and I do not mean that from an ordinary view in a negative sense. It is supposed to get more and more complicated. But now look, part of its running job, if the mind's job, if I said it, the mind's job is to make life more complicated, more complex. And again, that is not a pejorative statement. I could have said more interesting because it has to become more complicated to get more interesting, more entertaining, but more interesting to keep men continually, collectively speaking, to keep them continually, neurally on the move, to keep trying to aspire to something new without any judgment of what that may be now. But that is, let's I say that I start off and say that is the primary job of the mind. And let's say that for the sake of this commentary, you go, okay, I got that. Now I say, well, all right, there's actually a subdivision. It's, it's, it's part of the same job description, but its job is to make life more and more complex. But half the time, now it's part of the same job description, I want you to understand, but half the time at least, it's a fair figure, 50% of its working time is spent criticizing other people's, other, other people's minds, their job, the work they're doing in making life more complex. You understand? Now, it's part of the same job description. You're not that, you don't have to leave your desk, much less. You can do them both right there. But now I understand you have, let's take a fictional example. Mr. John Q. Public, middle class, sane. His mind, 50% of the time, is in charge. He's charged with the responsibility of trying to make life more complex, which is a form of progress. That's his job half the time. The other 50% of the time, he is charged with the responsibility of criticizing those same efforts in other people. Now, and believe me, I will not even be allegorically charitable and say that's an understatement. That's an exact old statement. So now look what we have. We have the crowning feature of Man the collective, of man as he is naturally produced, with an organ that is singular on this planet. Don't look down. His mind, his mind. Now some of you are, I don't know. started to say some of you are a bit backward, either that or certain, some of you are real egotistical and perhaps even, even living in a fool's paradise, paradise. Here we have man's mind, the highest form of evolution on this planet, a thing singular, and its job description, its job responsibility fits any description that you can give, such as I just did of it being singular, astounding, without equal. Its job is to continue to make what appears to be not itself, that is life out there to make out there more complex. That in some way it is aiding, is assisting in the evolution of everything. Because things must become more complex. That is the definition, even at the simplest biological level, is that things become more complex as they become more evolved. They can process more information. They can process, they can use greater and greater types of stimuli and quantity, but different types of stimuli. They produce more and more complex, fresher responses to the incoming stimuli. It is a running, that they are like a moving process machine, intellectually, that they go along taking in information and then trying to put out new ideas. They'll hear about a problem. They'll hear about some new idea in science, biology, physics. They'll just hear a political problem stated. In a man's mind, whether he gets out and acts on it or not, it is part of his responsibility to hear it and to think, wait a minute. I tell you, in Washington, they'd be a lot better off instead of passing a law for that if they'd go back, blah, blah, blah. If they would, what they'd need to do is just forget that and pass a new law, blah, blah, blah. Or they hear something about how the economy is, uh, at first, was uh, thought to be in the large heavy industries in the Northeast, was starting to make a comeback. The heavy industries such as the steel mills and then 
the economy seemed to have gone slipped back downhill, and now people say, well, here's what happened. And the man may be sitting there at home, no degree in economics, but, and he may never say anything. But up here, he responds to it, perhaps, and says, you know what they should do? And his idea itself, believe it or not, is not lost. That's, that's not, I'm not, you know I'm not trying to make it sound too funny money, too hocus pocus, but he is feeding the collective thinking of man by sitting there at home alone and responding to a way that to him is more complex than what he heard. To him, it's almost original thinking. It's not because it's simply a response to stimuli. But you understand that you sit there at home, let's say, and you can solve some of the world's problems. That you just think, well, you, you, know, you dumb bastards, why don't you do so-and-so? Now, it can go further. He, it can go to write letters to the editor. It might be a, a field in which he has some professional expertise or in which he may be professionally involved. So he may try to bring about some new direction in his field. He is adding to the storehouse of ever-increasing complexity of life. The time. Directly. That is, it seems, though, that he directly, whether he does it in his own brain or whether he overtly attempts to share, he is adding to, apparently, from himself, he is trying to add to the complexity. Half the time. The other half, remember, is really the same job description. But the other half, he has spent somewhat as a rear guard defender in criticizing other people attempting to do the same thing, other minds attempting to do the same thing. I mean, that should be clear. They sing there, let's say, in your home, watching TV, and you hear the news about some ex having a trade imbalance with a certain other country. And the president says, well... No, uh, I'm going to propose legislation, such and such. And you're sitting there and you go, well, that's stupid. You know, that's not the way to do it. We've been through that. I'm just making this up. I don't have anything in mind. But you, you're sitting there and you go, all right, we shouldn't do that. I'll tell you what we should do. You're thinking to yourself, what we should do is just, and then you come up with some idea. That to you, that if we do so-and-so, that would get their attention. Or by God, it would make them quit going in a direction that's detrimental to us. And you think that. So you, right then, you have done half of the, your charged responsibilities as a thinking, ordinary person. You know, you know, sooner you get through with that, they're not there on the news, they cut from the president to a member of Congress of the opposing party. And the opposing party says, uh, that is old, that's old news, we have heard that kind of thing come from the executive branch of government before, we've heard it from several administrations, but I'm going to tell you what I think. And he comes up with a counterproposal, which was not the one you thought, but he comes up with one to the one that you just tried to counteract. You understand? So this guy says, here's what we should do. And now you're into the other half of your charge responsibility. He gets through with that and you go, good grief. No wonder we don't get anywhere. You understand? You're dealing with what appeared to be two things. The president ha offered one idea. Your mind went, no, no, no. And I'm just, remember, don't look for anything specific. But in your mind, you, you did something. You threw out into the invisible well of collective thinking at that time and place, you threw out an idea, a possibility that was more complex than the present proposed in this area. I'm not saying better or worse. There's no, that's not even the point, remember. We're talking about the civilized world. There's no better or worse. Well, unless you have the intelligence of a beaver with a small tumor. So you first, you add the first part of your job, the 50% of your responsibility, you react to what the president said, and your idea was more complex. Then, they went from the president, that's half your job, to this other guy, to this uh, spokesman for the opposing party in the congressional branch, and he says, no, 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 the president's ideas will not do, here's what we should do. So he presents another idea, proposal. You react to that. Not to improve it, you act to it just on the basis of criticizing it. Oh, no. No. <laughs> no. It might be a bit more than that, but that is all that's really necessary, is you give some opposition. Because it is not lost. Now, personally, it's never going to amount to anything with you, as you should know by now. But that is why you have to do it. That is why people sit around and talk to the TV. That's why people talk to themselves. It is not a form of some psychological... Regression, that is part of man's ordinary 
responsibility is talking to yourself does add to whatever the story collective thinking is at the time. But the problem is you apparently are having to add, or you're supposed to be adding little suggestions, little bits and pieces of what would be more complex notions, more complex ideas. And the other half of the time is criticizing other people who are likewise throwing them in, like, no, 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 not that one. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. But here's what we're faced with now, back to me inviting you to take a much wider view of it. Totally non-selective. We now have this fantastic, one-of-a-kind operation to wit, the human mind, in charge of making life more and more, continually, non-stop, more and more complex, which is a form of progress, evolution. Making it more complex, but it is likewise charged with criticizing the process. We took, I know, three nights covering, at least any of you think that you're experiencing some sort of higher level deja vu, or else figuring that my mind's becoming soggy. For three nights we have covered that two-line refrain of livers are livers, spleens are spleens, and this is concerning the human mind, remember. And this is the strangest case ever seen. Three nights ago we did that, and then two nights the doctor reappeared and said he didn't think that you got the origin of the diagnosis, and he offered it a I took up the banner in the name of good mental health tonight and gave you a follow-up. If you recall, I read it again. Livers are livers, spleens are spleens, referring to the human mind, remember. And this is the strangest case ever seen because there is no doubt if you're an ordinary, sane, reasonably constructed person, Lungs are lungs, ears are ears, toes are toes. What else is new? I mean, if, if in any verbalize, if it were not true, trouble. You should be in the hands of a doctor. That if suddenly your liver goes, I believe, I like the idea of inhaling and exhaling. <laughs> this, this is not progress. You know that. You won't even make it into the freak show. You won't live that long. So livers are livers, planes are planes, et cetera. But to the human mind, this is the strangest case ever seen. So tonight, the wrap-up I gave, as I simply put it to you this way, the brain is the only organ that will deny it does what it does. <laughs> that was along about the middle of tonight's news items. Then toward the end, it says, an expansion of an earlier item, which was referring to the one I just related. And that said that man is the only creature who will deny that he is what he is. The enlightenment, awakening of consciousness. Can you chew on the fact, the possibility that it might be no more than freedom from believing that or from that? We have the human mind, the avant-garde activity, the primary operation, the primary job, the primary purpose that man has on this planet is in his mental operation. The brain at the non neural level, the non it is at the mental level. And so you have him now fulfilling his function collectively of making life continually more and more rich, more and more complex, more and more entangled, more and more complex. And complicated and simultaneously criticizing it, bitching about it, complaining about it. The brain is the only organ that will deny that it does what it does. Am I going to have to dilute, spread thin, take those two and make them fit like peanut butter and jelly <laughs> on the two halves of your? cortical sandwich <laughs> well besides me continually picking on criticism which is not the point <laughs> give me a break you can look 
throughout the history of religion, philosophy, and et cetera, of people, whether they knew what they were speaking of or not, opining in ways and sundry that picking on your fellow man is not particularly kosher, or if you're Christian, Christian-like, <laughs> charitable, humane. There have, there's a continuing low-level vein in the or distribution of man's mental history that criticizes criticism. But it does not do it as directly as I'm putting it to you now, which is the same as saying last time, pointing out to you that none of the publicly recognized descriptions of how man might evolve ever point, ever deal directly with the one place where he might evolve. You know, all right. There. Now we talk about the heart and the spirit and etc. Thus, all of the apparent aspects in philosophy, religion, etc., in man's intellectual life, have been critiques, censures, caveats, prohibitions against picking on your fellow man for no real good reason, maybe. That don't overdo it. Give him a break. Or, hey, let's kill everybody and let God straighten it out later. It was one of the later philosophical ideas, I think, that came from the Green Berets in our recent <laughs> adventure in Vietnam. Kill them. Straighten it out later. Now, if you think about it, I know you normally would find that tattooed on the T-shirt of a guy in a bark backer bar whom you wouldn't ask you know, what he thinks of your hairstyle. <laughs> And yet it is, it's, it's not that far removed from uh, treat your fellow man as yourself, give your neighbor a break, walk a mile in his shoes, don't try and pick the spike out of his eye, etc. But it never comes directly to what I'm describing because, again, they, as always, in the collective area, it is specific, it is always selective, and it appears to be directed from outer worldly, usually. Well, if it's religious it is, that God doesn't want you to. And people think, well, I want to pick on my fellow man. It seems as natural as wanting to spit off a high building. If you're a man, and if you're a woman, I don't know what's wrong with you people. The rest of it. But it seems as natural just to spit as it does for a man to, to criticize people who need it. Which is at least half the world. And then he goes to some little tent revival. His wife drags him down to the assembly of God finally. And they say, don't criticize. Your fellow man, he, it's not up to you to criticize. And the guy thinks, well, hell yeah, it is. It's always been my job. And he looks around, he can't believe people are doing this. I'm making up a thing. The first time a guy shows up his 20s, let's say, and the, <laughs> the preacher notices him kind of looking like, what? And he goes, sir, I'm not saying that. It's not me. And the guy goes, yeah. He says, God, you know, the guy that made everything else, he said it. It's right here in his book. So here's this guy, you know, the first time in church, and he goes, uh-oh. Because he thought he had the guy. He thought he was going to get him and leave and tell his wife he wasn't ever coming back here. But the minister saw it, that look on his face and went, hey, hey, hold on there. I didn't say that. Right here, look at it, paid so-and-so. God said, give your fellow man, a, don't pick on your fellow man. It's yourself. And he thinks, come here now, seriously. But, see, it appears to be otherworldly because the idea of being critical is not some spiritual anomaly. It is not an attribute of man's sinful nature. It is one half of the natural responsibility of man's intellect to be critical. But all I'm trying to get you to see is woven within that is continually, it continues to be uh, fairly inoperative caveats against it. It's like, don't do it. God don't want you to do it. But even when it's in religion, people say, well, I can't stop it. And the priest says, yeah, I know I can't either. But you're not, you know, at least feel guilty about it and do some Hail Marys. <laughs> Being critical is natural. It is as natural to man's mind as it is for the lungs to breathe. So you have. Now let's get, skip all the idea of spiritual and words from God and extra systemic Info coming in, directions coming in. Do not stay up all night waiting for that. Let's go right to this.
where it belongs. Man is critical. The mind is critical. From the level of consciousness down in man's nervous system, there is no such thing as criticism. There is a fight to survive again, but as we've already covered, animals do not criticize. A gazelle does not criticize a lion in that final seconds when it leaps at its throat and it realizes, Martha, I'm coming home. You know? Wait for me, darling, here I come. The gazelle doesn't go, boy, is that, I, I, am, I told you this neighborhood, we're living around a bunch of ruffians. There is no criticism. And it can be destruction, but there is no criticism. The only criticism is in areas that are non-fatal, in areas that, in a sense, are irrelevant. So consider the irrelevancy if the criticism, consider that if everything's irrelevant there to start with, where cometh thou, if I may speak biblically, where cometh thou off being <laughs> Well, just because you're speaking in old English, there's no, no reason you can't try and put together a sentence correctly. <laughs> Figure how these old guys from... 4,000 years ago, these old Jewish guys and Arab guys living in the Middle East that you pick up a Bible in a motel and they're speaking old English? <laughs> Talk about your miracles. <laughs> and for a strange reason, everything that they believed back then, they could tell the future because it turned out three and 4,000 years later, in a land far removed, that fine green island of Great Britain, everything they said, King James agreed with. <laughs> and, and they knew it in advance for some, I don't know. <laughs> Didn't mean to get into deep do th theology, but. So we have this great organ, this great instrument, this great operation of man's intellect, and it, it alone, not man's body, it alone makes life more and more enriched, more complex, it moves and expands the evolution of life on this planet. That, and it does so by making things more complicated, more complex. Then that same thing, nobody else, no, no evil spirits, no horned men and with horns and a pitchfork, no subconscious traumas, no nothing except the same thing. The same thing turns right around and criticizes it. No one finds this. How can you go to movies? I mean, no offense. How can you watch TV or read a book or a newspaper and think that's interesting? Oh, ye of small taste. Oh, ye of mundane gross taste. Or to watch comedians. That's better yet. To think that they're funny. No. They're just trying. Life's got it. Life, life doesn't have to try. That you have now, but then if you're part of them, take the criticism seriously. You understand that. I can go through it right quick. It's don't look for Captain Irony, because you are him. As you can turn right around, people do it constantly. Not only are offering, at least half the time, their own input into making life more complex, that is, answering and adding to what would be the growing complexity of life, where their ideas and acted, which eventually may be part of that which comes to pass. But... Also turning around and criticizing other people's ideas. And then, in their spare time, criticizing the whole affair. Just, it, it happens that they are not necessarily specific. They just stand around a street corner or they go to pick up their car and they find out, you mean just fixing a sticky valve on the uh, fuel injection system is $650? Are you, I could just forget carburetor. I was like, people are in the, he says, I remember my first car, $50. What in the hell's going on here in life? And many of the mechanics people say, I go, you're right, Jesus. I mean, the very people charging him. And they're not being sarcastic. They go, you're right. I'm, you know, bumpers. Hey, it's a good thing you didn't hurt your bumper. <laughs> my, my brother owns a body shop next door. Damn bumpers cost more than the whole car dog. And everybody goes, Shh. All right, we could take several views of, of that, which you can do on your own. You could, you could criticize that. You could criticize it as being useless sarcasm. You could criticize it on what, you, if you're ordinary, you might consider to be a somewhat higher level of it being ironic, but it's not. You are criticizing criticism. 
You are criticizing the life, the ever-expanding, omnidirectional, omnipresent expansion of life. You're just criticizing the whole thing out of hand, and you'll get many people staying around agreeing. <laughs> That's true. But then take that own story that right then. There you stand with a car, a car that has a fuel injection system. Not, not carburetors like God intended. No, I don't know if things got out of hand. There's a little humor. There you stand with a car, with a suit, made out of synthetic materials <laughs> in a garage, in a building that's air conditioned. got equipment over there that they work on cars. they got equipment that costs more than your car. they got equipment probably there in that garage that costs more than your whole house. And they're staying over there. they got beepers on. they got watches, TVs running, stereo. There you are in the midst of all this. The cost of fixing the jets on your fuel injection. This is not irony. It's not sarcasm. Do you see? The criticism of the complexity of life adds there too. But from a, a view of someone trying, for anybody who would like to know, you know, the whole idea of awakening, it so that you know what, that's what the awakening is. I mean, I'm sure you guys have figured that out. Is you, you wrong. Part of this flow gradual, normal expansion, you'll never know what's going on because what's going on, you're a part of. It is another version of where we left off last time of me pointing out that those who know can't tell you what it is. Those that try to tell you what it is and don't know, even if you say, you're holding back on me, they go, yeah. If you say, you're, there's something you're not telling me, they go, well, they'd like to smile enigmatically about having to admit it which is just as good with a drugstore mystic anyways, with their kind of inquiry, like, you're holding, there's something you're not telling me. And there you go. But what they're not telling you is what they don't know. Which is if you're part of the normal expansion, that is the normal critical, the normal adding to of the gradual complexity of life and simultaneously criticizing the growing complexity of life, you'll never know. And you keep thinking, well, there's something wrong here. Yeah. And then you go, well, what is it? <laughs> then you say, well, what's he pointing at? <laughs> the person that asked the question, I'm pointing at them. Well, what is it? <laughs> Let's leave on a...